I'm delighted to be joined by uh, one of the uh, fellows of the Sunningdale Institute at the National School, David Tranfield from Cranfield University. Well, David, I've found your session this morning very interesting indeed, the, the DNA of high reliability uh, within organisations. And um, one thing that jumps out at me is perhaps the obvious question, that uh, at any given point in time there's enormous pressure on the public service to reduce its spending so there's a tension there, it seems to me, from the outset. Now, is it actually possible for organisations to reduce their costs and at the same time improve their reliability? Well, Bob, you're absolutely right. There's always enormous pressure uh, on the public sector to reduce the costs. There's always enormous pressure on everybody to reduce sure. the, uh, the, the costs. Uh, so it's a, it's a good question. But, you know, there's a bit of a fallacy in, in thinking that high reliability is, lies at the opposite end to cost reduction. If you look at what's going on in the private sector, uh, many of the, uh, the big successful companies, and Toyota springs to mind straight away, have actually reduced their costs by uh, focusing on the reliability of their operation. Because what that means is that things only need doing once instead of twice or three times or four times or, or other mechanisms being put in place to recover what have been disastrous situations. Mm -hmm. There's a huge saving in that. And so reliability and efficiency are not at the opposite ends of the same uh, continuum. They're actually two quite uh, supportive and complementary activities uh, inside companies. So the question of uh, whether or not it's possible for organisations to reduce cost uh, and be highly reliable um, it is really the wrong question. The question is uh, much more, can an organisation uh, become uh, an efficient organisation without being highly reliable? I, see. I think that's much more problematic. Okay, fair point. Now you talk about failure tolerant organisations. Now what actually do you mean by that and how would you know whether you're in one or not? Okay, well that's a bit more difficult. Um, I think the general argument would be that um, once we've tried to reduce costs inside organisations, then naturally people give it a good go and they, uh, they reduce costs as much as they possibly can until things start to go wrong. Uh, the usual strategy then is to uh, pop a little bit of resource back and reinforce those operations or routines or systems or processes that have started to go adrift. Uh, and because things were going wrong, then they, they're aware of the fact that um, they've become efficient, they've, they've gone lean. Now, that's fine in itself. We, we've actually found a point at which uh, the, the, the organisation is working more efficiently. The problem is that, uh, unnoticed quite often by everyone, uh, in going through that process, uh, the people on the receiving end have come to expect that things will go wrong mm -hmm. inside their organisation. In all sorts of, of micro ways, they will come to work expecting, like good corporate citizens, as most people are, to do a good job and be as efficient as they possibly can. Uh, but then when things go wrong, that becomes an accepted way of life. We know that that's what should happen. Now that's what I mean by we have created failure tolerant organisations. We come to work expecting failure to happen to us. And when it happens, it's okay. In fact, if it doesn't happen on a regular enough basis, then we're not trying hard enough. Mm -hmm. And so we build that into our operational culture. Now, uh, that's where the danger lies, that as soon as we start to tolerate that things uh, shouldn't be uh, as they are supposed to be, particularly in our core operations, uh, it's very obvious where you get major failure, like rail crashes or... Uh, air crashes like Concorde or something like that. Mm. Uh, but we can build that in in much smaller ways so people might not receive their benefits on time, but does it really matter? Uh, the uh, children, uh, teachers may not mark papers and hand them back to students on time. Does that really matter? We start to build in failure tolerance in all sorts of small ways right the way across our organisations. Now that doesn't do us any good. It doesn't do us any good in terms of uh, efficiencies. It doesn't do us any good in terms of fulfilling our mission, particularly in the medium term. Mm -hmm. And this is where we start to run risks in terms of, of whether the organisation will survive. Because when we have lots of failures, and they've all been tolerated, sometimes we get a chance occurrence that will suddenly bring all this together uh, and cause a major disaster or a major problem. Now, a good example of that was the Concorde flight, which went down in France where if you read the report on that Concorde flight, 
uh, the plane was um, about six tons overweight because it had 19 bags unaccounted for. It had 1,200 litres of unused taxi fuel in tank 11, which was top of the tail fin. It had taken off with an 8.3 kilometre per hour tailwind behind it. Now, all of those features would not bring down Concorde, mm. but they all create a situation where when you get a little bit of bad luck, as it did, picking up a piece of metal on the runway and causing a, a fire in tank number five, there is no slack in the system for the pilot to be able to manoeuvre. Mm. There is no wriggle room. Mm. And what happens in those circumstances is this lack of wriggle room causes catastrophe and causes major problem. It allows cast error to cascade through the system and, and to multiply as one error lines up with another error. It's a bit like the, um, the, the holes in the Roquefort cheese argument. If you imagine slices of Roquefort cheese with holes representing little bits of errors that are mm. in the system every day, quite naturally. But as soon as they line up, then that's when disaster happens, when, um, when, when the whole thing becomes uh, an arrow that can be driven uh, right the way through it. You, your research seems to show that um, highly reliable organisations, on the other hand, of course, spend a lot of time giving analysis to things that have gone wrong in the past. Um, really exploring the rationale for that so they can learn from it. Now, do you think that's ever going to happen in the public sector, that there's going to be uh, resources and energy uh, and indeed profile given to analysing failure? Well, I really think it, it, it ought to, given the number of headlines that we, we get from time to time. Um, but you're right, it, it takes uh, resource to do that. Uh, it means it does mean focusing on creating uh, what I'd call information-rich environments. Uh, environments in we, which uh, we can look at the patterning of what is happening inside our organisation. A good example of this was uh, some work I was doing in, um, uh, with the, uh, the DFES, looking at, uh, at schools. You know, there is a high reliability skills movement, mm -hmm. um, and it's quite interesting to look at what the high reliability skills have done. They've created information-rich environments, which give the teachers uh, and the headmaster all sorts of information about the progress of students and the way in which they've addressed their studies and the success rates that they've had in various subjects over the years that they were in the school. And sometimes that takes uh, failure at uh, GCSE level or A level uh, all the way back through to uh, the early years in the school or even back into the primaries. Uh, in one interesting example in, in, in one school, um, the, the, the secondary school actually traced a group uh, of, uh, of boys who had failed uh, at, um, in mathematics and particularly failed in spatial geometry and looked at their progress all the, all the way through their years in the school. And they'd failed every year, but been allowed to progress to the next level. And the failure actually went back to the primary. In fact, uh, the secondary school actually found the teacher in the primary school who didn't understand it herself right. and who had caused the, the failure in the, in the first instance. Now, that process of creating that information-rich environment is no different to the process that a company like Toyota uh, would undertake in looking at a failure in a component in a car and tracing that component all the way back to the original manufacturer. And that original ma manufacturer may be uh, outsourced in so uh, somewhere, could, could be somewhere in India or China, and they'd go back and they'd talk to the uh, original maker of that component to put right the error at source. Yeah. So it never again is allowed to cascade all the way through until it becomes a major failure of a component that puts the car out of action. So really you, you're just adopting the same set of processes uh, as uh, is adopted in, in, in that environment.